All right, uh, hello and welcome to uh, our event here between the Community Agency for Rural Development and Celex Development. Uh, we are here in Yangon, Myanmar today to explore a oft and critical problem uh, in the world today, uh, namely uh, digital economic transformation. Uh, however, this we believe is an opportunity for countries in smaller states, frontier nations at all, uh, to be able to make paramount leapfrogs in terms of their development uh, within this process. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome the following uh, uh, people uh, who are going to be speaking at today's event. Um, first, we're going to have uh, Mr. Siegfried Wolf. Uh, he is the research director of the South Asia Democratic Forum, uh, it, which is an EU institution based out of Brussels. Uh, so, uh, Siegfried, uh, thank you for being here today. We are, yes, yes. Uh, we also have U Ting Tun U. Uh, he is the director for the Teninga um, Institute for Strategic Studies, uh, which is a very prominent think tank uh, here in um, in Myanmar, um, and we'll be learning more about uh, what he does uh, today as well. We have uh, Stente Vo, yes, and he is from Mekong Economics. Uh, they do very interesting um, work in terms of economic research, uh, in terms of development. Uh, they also do some things uh, in connection with the UN uh, as well. Uh, next, we have Oksana Lozitskaya. Uh, Oksana is the founder and author of the Digital System Transformation in Belarus, and she was very influential in the outcome of um, President Alexander Lukashenko's uh, Decree Number no. 8, uh, and she will be talking about digital transformation um, in terms of uh, how it can be galvanized in terms of interregional um, cooperation in terms of digital transformation. All right. We have Scott Duncan in the room today. Scott Duncan uh, has um, experience uh, with the Australian government, with the Central Coast Council uh, in New South Wales, Australia. Uh, his uh, specialty is urban and town planning. Um, Scott will be uh, also talking uh, along with Oksana uh, about how technologies can galvanize uh, interregional integration. Uh, we have uh, Professor Alexei uh, Voskresensky, and he is the uh, director for the Center of Integrated Synology and regional projects at the Moscow State Institute of Inter International Relations. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Ne Ung, the founder uh, and CEO of Owe. And we also have uh, Rav Ravindra Jain as well. And we have Kieran Rabbit. They will be coming in for a later session today. Um, Next, we have uh, Dr. Min Zha Wu, who is the uh, executive director. And we have Paulo Kasaka. And Paulo Kasaka is a former member of the EU Parliament. Uh, he will be speaking on uh, the exploration of prospects for creating an rural, uh, rural urban uh, mixed economy across uh, territories. And then we have uh, Ms. Shravana Barua. Uh, who will also be speaking later today uh, on that same topic. Um, she is from the Nepal Institute of International Cooperation. Um, last, lastly, for the last session, we have uh, Professor Victor Kane. Yes, if you can see him. Okay. Okay. And uh, he is the head of the Asia Graduate Center. Uh, as far as the School of Business and Management at RMIT University in Vietnam. Uh, next, we have um, uh, the Emerging Europe Alliance as well, uh, which will be brought in via Skype. Uh, and 
it will be very interesting to learn about as well. Um, to, to wit, uh, we believe that Emerging Europe Alliance is quite interesting. Uh, so Relics Development uh, has decided to join the Emerging Europe Alliance uh, as well. Um, the Emerging Europe Alliance represents 23 countries uh, in terms of uh, how uh, economic development strategies can propel the region forward, uh, including the Republic of Belarus. Uh, so I would like to, um, you know, uh, welcome all of you here today. And uh, I think that we have a diverse, uh, you know, array of speakers on various topics uh, that we can come together and fill the tapestry of what digital transformation is. Uh, we need uh, support in terms of technological and sub-technological groups. Uh, there's the need to galvanize political support. Uh, there's the need to uh, galvanize and uh, stimulate the interest of think tanks and other um, regional uh, organizations. Uh, so uh, it is with my uh, deepest honor to uh, have all you, all of you uh, here today, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of discussions we can have today. I would like to mention, though, that this is a uh, Relics Development event along with CAD, and in that sense, uh, if any of you would like to contribute to the discussion at any time, because you can see this is a very intimate group, okay, uh, by, by all, any means, uh, raise your hand. You can do so during a presentation, and then one of uh, our technicians over here will give you the mic, um, because we believe that uh, as far as relics development, Real development comes when the insights of uh, all the community uh, is heard. So that's our uh, motto as far as being, uh, you know, working, collaborating with what we call proxy developers rather than investors. Okay. Uh, so it, uh, without further ado, I would like to welcome uh, Joseph Win Hlaeng Uh Please come to the stage, sir. Good morning, everybody. Actually, uh, we are a bit already late, so I will skip my time. But uh, as a hosting country and organization, uh, I would like to welcome you all that uh, your participation. And this event is, uh, uh, I hope, promoting our country among Europe, among Russia, and around the world that Myanmar is one of the, the best places where uh, digital economy can be done by investors around the world. So uh, please bring this in, uh, message. Please bring the experience in Yangon to your neighbors around the world that uh, Myanmar is welcoming foreign investors and bringing technology for our country people. And uh, I hope you enjoy today and tomorrow. I'm very sorry that the holiday management team wrongly pro produced the banner, so we are a bit late. But that's why, to save the time and to follow the schedule, I will skip my PowerPoint and my presentation. I I let you start. 
from the rest. So thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy your stay here. Bye bye. Thank you. Uh, I believe that uh, I can provide uh, enough ancillary information uh, so that we can get a good idea of what Joseph does, uh, because it does uh, tie into uh, our presentation uh, as well. If you can please load up the presentation, please. Yeah. Uh, so uh, from starters, uh, let me give you a brief uh, outline of my background. Uh, I uh, not only have an anti-fraud background, uh, like fewer of you in the room, but like many of you in the room, uh, I do have a geopolitics background as well. Uh, I was the uh, project leader for uh, various initiatives, uh, both in terms of cybersecurity as well as uh, Asia-Pacific economy and cooperation. Uh, so I did that for uh, some years, and I advised for uh, various uh, governments and Fortune 500 companies uh, during that time. Um, I then moved into private equity, <clears throat> and when I was doing so, uh, I realized that um, there was an issue uh, with it in the sense of when you were finding uh, investors, and when you were matching it with projects, uh, I noticed a little bit of a quandary when I was doing this in countries such as Thailand and Cambodia and Vietnam and so on and so forth. And the issue was, and really came down to, uh, the fact that the, the projects were located in um, places where investors were from the first round of filtering would not even consider these places for investment. Uh, I had interesting talks with uh, key decision makers at Walmart and uh, also uh, uh, other um, big box retailers such as Costco, um, you know, come to Vietnam. And they said, right away, uh, this country does not fit within our uh, suitability profile. And so it's going to have to be up for the next review. Let's talk in 2020. Not the kind of response I was going uh, to expect, uh, but too many investment considerations were made upon the fact of, first off, where's the country? Where's the country? Not what is the quality of the project at hand, okay? Uh, what we did is we set out to change that. And in 2017, uh, I came up with the idea that essentially frontier markets, um, were being judged on what country they were from rather than the quality of the project in which that it came from. Um, so in regards to that, uh, we found out that there, uh, of the uh, countries in the world, the top 10 countries um, got 75% of all eligible investment capital into all countries. And that made no sense to me. Uh, there's 200 countries in the world, yet only 10 countries are getting the brunt of the investment. Now, is fraud rife in these 10 countries? You betcha. Uh, just in the UK last year, there was a building stadium that was made in one of the top 10 countries uh, that uh, tens of millions of dollars was absconded from uh, because they were unable to track dispersed funds for the construction of a stadium. The people of this township had firsthand knowledge, in a developed country, mind you, of the issues that came with uh, disbursement of investment via our traditional system. Uh, we set out to change that, and by using uh, blockchain in order to create an immutable record between investor and developer, and also by being able to track when the withdrawals took place within the country of the developer, we realized we're able to solve this problem. And so in 2018, we set out to create interest uh, of uh, investment uh, within the country of Vietnam, and as well as other countries. And we found out that this uh, solution was able to better facilitate foreign direct investment 
into these uh, frontier and developing countries, of which that I believe my um, presentation is finally ready, yes? So uh, if you guys can uh, bring it to the, the first page, if, if you could so kindly do so. So yeah, we have our presentation. Um, sometimes uh, we all have late flights in, in our lives, but the most important thing is to get to our destination. Hopefully without the, too much ruffled feathers, yeah? So um, I am the CEO of Relics. I gave you an idea as far as what my background is. Um, and what we do is um, we work with uh, real estate development and uh, crowdfunding. Uh, on the blockchain. And I'm going to explain exactly what that is and exactly how this plays into uh, digital transformation uh, as a whole. Okay. All right, so what is Relix? So Relix is the world's first cryptocurrency uh, real estate development investment platform. I mentioned that to be very specific. Um, there are many cryptocurrencies um, out there and uh, there has been very little delivery on actual um, translation from promises into product or promises into service. Uh, we have already taken care of all of those things. Uh, we set out to, um, to determine a crowdfunding jurisdiction and we did so. And we set out to um, you know, build our platform so that we're able to uh, house and assist uh, investments in developed and developing countries around the world, of which we've already uh, done so. Uh, so you can see the next sentence as far as Relics provides transparency, accountability, and immutability to real estate investment development uh, opportunities that could otherwise be considered too risky and opaque. That's exactly what I was talking about before uh, in terms of that you have a riskier profile uh, from the appearance if you go through a traditional filtering system on projects. Uh, but what you're missing out is when you're filtering by country rather than filtering by the actual quality of the project, uh, you are missing out on very, very, very lucrative uh, opportunities. Uh, in the past 10 years, for instance, uh, in Vietnam, uh, there has been a huge boom, not only uh, in terms of raw GDP numbers, but in terms of um, very, very strong uh, FDI numbers uh, going into the country as well. Uh, but yet, there were many investors that considered Vietnam not to be an investable market uh, in terms of the real estate development market. And it also had knock-on effects on infrastructure as well. Uh, you have that against the background of a country where uh, it's very, very hungry for FDI. And you also have a situation where domestically uh, funding uh, these projects uh, from a domestic perspective alone uh, is challenging, to say the least. Yeah. So um, Relics, as far as participants in Relics, have the opportunity to invest in projects, commercial, industrial, residential, during the development phase, results in exciting opportunities such as passive income, equity stakes, proxy ownership of property. Okay. Um, in order to do this by not only being the first in the world to do so, we wanted to make sure that we did it in the most gold star way possible. Um, so we partnered with Catapult, uh, which is a uh, worldwide investment regulatory compliance uh, uh, solution uh, that we worked with. And what does that mean? Uh, it allows us to be compliant in multiple jurisdictions at the same time. Uh, which is actually what larger banks uh, have mentioned uh, in private conversations that they would like to do, but previously there wasn't a solution to do so. Uh, whereas with partnering with, uh, with, with Catapult, we're able to be, uh, offer, make offerings uh, around the world and also be compliant uh, across uh, various different countries. Okay, um, so when we, uh, right now we have uh, approval from the um, public of Belarus. Uh, if we want to diversify our offerings and we want to uh, do so, we can do it in Singapore 
or Hong Kong, and uh, we wouldn't be able to do so unless that we had the right compliance platform behind it. Uh, and I'm happy to say that we do have that. So next one, relics and numbers. Uh, in terms of 2018, uh, we delivered a 37% return on investment uh, for the full year from January 1st to December 31st of 2018. This is very profound in the context that most cryptocurrencies in 2018 um, lost money for their investors. Uh, instead of doing um, what we believe to be not an optimal solution, such as an ICO, uh, we in instead uh, went for a direct to market approach, and it was a very positive benefit in terms of our investors. Uh, so by year end, we were able to deliver a 37% year over year return when um, you know banks uh, came out with reports in 2018 where as much as 90% plus of total asset classes uh, went negative for the year of 2018. So we're talking about all asset classes across the board. We're talking about stocks, we're talking about bonds, we're talking about gold, we're talking about real estate. It was a very difficult year in order to get returns, yet we were still able to return uh, an investment return by the end of the year of 37%. Uh, to, from July to, uh, to year end, uh, we grew at a 29% growth rate uh, and we had about 300 users uh, from the launch of the platform from uh, October to now. So um, here's very important, and this is uh, what I was mentioning with Joseph. By the end of 2019, 10% of the Relics infrastructure arm, which is a dedicated uh, amount of uh, Relics uh, tokens, you could say 10% uh, of the money supply, okay, has been devoted to uh, government infrastructure projects uh, of which that we have already uh, dispersed 10% of our relics infrastructure arm to Joseph Win Halang U's uh, road building project uh, in Western Myanmar, uh, of which that I hope that you have time later on to talk more about, uh, perhaps at the closing note. Yes. Um, all right. Uh, I said that before that um, you know traditionally uh, you have a um, you have a balance between investors and developers, whereas this is more of a uh, a proxy developer relationship. And what does that mean? Uh, proxy developers are people that actively take part in the development of the infrastructure project of the real estate project, and we believe that this brings. Uh, superior results in terms of better ideas, better implementation, better oversight, uh, more eyes on the project. And we also believe it creates less fraud. Okay? Uh, we believe ultimately that this makes projects uh, more investable and more attractive to uh, investors. Okay, So um, gets an idea as far as the proxy development model there. All right. Uh, some of our projects, uh, we've worked with uh, Empire Group uh, in Vietnam. Uh, we also have, uh, as far as on our proxy development platform, we've been working with FLC Group regarding the yacht port uh, that uh, our managing director, Peter Lee, who is uh, XVP at JP Morgan, uh, proposed uh, to FLC Group. Uh, in uh, at, at a la uh, last year's event, as far as uh, our annual investors event of relaxation, yeah. Uh, so that's just an idea as far as uh, what we have. Look at the final sentence, okay? This offerings for a full unit purchase that'll give an estimated return of 11% annually for eight years. It's actually not an estimated; it's a developer guarantee. So you're dealing with a country that gives you an 11% guaranteed return for eight years, yet it's in Vietnam. So the very fact that the USD is going into the USD bank system in Vietnam alone turns people off because they are unsure where their money is going to go once it ends up in a bank account that's not theirs. The one thing that I can give you guys to take away is that the difference between a blockchain-based transaction and a USD-based transaction, you cannot audit or check the other person's bank account once that you've sent the funds over. That is when the opaque proce uh, process begins, and you are unable to see as far as what's going on with that transaction. If you don't believe me, 
make a $100 investment into a country other than Myanmar, other than the country that you're from, try to call the bank and try to make them disclose to you what exactly happened with your investment capital once it was sent out. I guarantee you, you're going to have a headache in doing so. Whereas in the comfort of your own home, you can track where your funds went to, when the developer actually withdrew the funds, and then we have a better idea how to gauge metrics of phase one, underground construction. How was that executed? How were the funds dispersed? Was it done in an efficient manner? And so on and so on and so forth. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that we solve, and we're happy to say that we're the first in the world to implement uh, such solution in the field in the field of blockchain-based real estate development. Okay, uh, and there are many implications to infrastructure uh, as well. Okay, so what's next for Relix? Uh, we're looking for the right jurisdiction. Uh, well, that's actually a little bit um, dated because we already have the right jurisdiction. Uh, we just opened up a new joint stock company in uh, Republic of Belarus uh, because we were attracted by the opportunities afforded by not only decree number eight uh, as far as uh, President Alexander Lukashenko's degree, uh, as well as the benefits afforded to foreign investors in the Orsha offshore investment zone, uh, which is brand new and offers even greater incentives, arguably, than does the park of high technologies. Um, we secondly, uh, we are deepening cooperation with governments to launch more infrastructure offerings, uh, providing more and more people with access to financial tools and funding. Currently, we have uh, government cooperation with local authorities in Belarus, Vietnam, uh, and we are also uh, working more closely uh, with concerned parties in Myanmar as well. Um, as far as number three, uh, we are forging relationships with new investors in preparation for uh, a large scale rollout use of our proxy development platform across countries, territories, and regions. Uh, and as well as I told you, as far as our proxy development model uh, as well, yeah? So that's basically uh, Relics in a nutshell. Uh, but what we're doing uh, in uh, one sentence or less, maybe two, is we are overturning the old order in which only these top 10 countries get 75% of all real estate investment consideration. Uh, we don't consider that's really a fair deal as far as the world is concerned, and our blockchain solution is set to uh, overturn that and achieve that. Thank you. And if anybody has any questions, uh, please, you know.